Listener Production. Talking about consent or even hearing about it may be triggering for some people. This includes those who have experienced or are experiencing sexual violence or other forms of trauma. Support is available at 1800 Respect, National Domestic, Family and Sexual Violence Counselling Service, and information is also available at consent.gov.au. Hi, Sasha Barbagat with you for episode one of this four-part series of The Briefing, brought to you in conjunction with the federal government's campaign, Consent Can't Wait. Consent is much more than simply agreeing to being intimate with someone else. When consent is well understood, healthy sexual relationships will become the norm and sexual harm can be prevented. 53% of women and 25% of men have experienced sexual harassment in their lifetime. A separate study found 64% of non-binary people, 55% of trans men and 42% of trans women had experienced sexual assault. A national survey of Australian young people in 2021 found that 28% of young people agreed that when a man is very sexually aroused, he may not even realise that the woman doesn't want to have sex. And the government found almost half of people living in Australia were not confident in defining consent or were conflicted in their understanding of the topic. So it's clear we need to build a shared community understanding of consent and have important conversations with the younger generation. It is time for change. Carrie Bickmore is a Gold Logie winning television host and co-host of the hit network's Carrie and Tommy Drive show. She's also a mother to three children. She joins us with Consent Can't Wait ambassador and youth advocate Daniel Principe, who has been to 275 schools educating young people about these very topics. Carrie and Daniel, thanks so much for joining us on The Briefing today. No worries. It's good to be here. Thanks for having me. Let's talk through a handful of common myths because addressing some of the misconceptions I think will help us get a better understanding of what consent actually is. So here's one to start us off. If someone doesn't want sex, they'll just say no. I mean, I think we've all been in situations where we know that is just not the case. There's so many reasons why you don't speak up. There's fear of rejection. There's fear that you'll never get the opportunity again. There's all the emotions happening and not just as a teenager, I think as an adult, I think often we wish we had a voice um, and that we'd spoken up when we didn't. And I think the conversation around consent needs to happen and needs to happen now. And I think that is the reason why podcasts like this are so important and conversations are so important. And I think very much as a mum with my children, I never had these conversations with my parents as a kid and I grew up in a great household with amazing loving parents. They just weren't conversations that were had and I think I've had to really step out of my comfort zone to make sure I have these conversations with my kids and to understand and learn and read and get it wrong and all of that. So I'm very, very conscious of how we have this conversation and from the outset, I just want to make it known that I'm certainly no expert and by the sounds of the number of children Daniel's spoken to. I've only spoken to the three I have had, so I'm sure you've spoken to many more, Daniel. Any help I can get from Daniel, I'd appreciate as well. Yeah, so well said, Carrie. I think there's so many reasons why somebody may agree, whether they speak up or not, to go along with a particular act. There can be, you know, power imbalances. There could be threats. There could be fears, as you've touched on. And it's probably one of the most common things that I've seen in schools, and it's heartbreaking and I'm speaking within that dominant heterosexual context where I've just tragically listened to the stories of so many young women who have felt they had to go along, where there seemed to be this social conditioning and social norms of having to go along with certain things, or they might be seen as frigid and, of course, uh, shamed no matter what they do. Uh, And that's that. I can't imagine as a man what it's like to be put in that bind and that predicament. And that's not to say that men haven't felt like they've been vulnerable to certain pressures as well, but I can't certainly imagine the the stories that I've heard from young women. And I think there's these ideas that a lot of young people have that everybody's doing it, we need to, and and that this is something they just have to do. And it's kind of this social script Mm. that they're playing along with. Whereas I'm really interested in having conversations about what do we want? And can we go on that journey of finding out? Because even if you don't yet know what you want, that doesn't mean that you should be a victim of something that you don't desire uh, or that you don't fully understand as yet either. But I'm really interested in helping young people especially work out what feels good for them, what a respectful relationship is, how they can actually have boundaries, say no, and not feel bad about that, where they feel, especially young women, feel bad in saying no. 
that they owe some sort of explanation or apology for doing so. I also think while I wish I had had a louder voice over my lifetime as a woman, and I think we should encourage girls to find their power and find their voice and how to do that, because I don't always know how to do it. I think it's up to guys, not just expect women to say yes or no, but to be aware of the situation, to be aware of people's behaviour. And and I think consent isn't just about words. It's about watching somebody's body language and uh, how they're responding to what's happening. And I know it's nuanced and I know, especially as a teenager, you're learning it as you go. And that's why I think we just need to constantly learn as we grow and have conversations and have conversations with other parents. What are you finding is happening with your kids? Be being confident to have conversations with our kids, but for kids to have conversations with their friends as well and for to remove this taboo, to remove the embarrassment, to remove the feeling of shame so that the more we talk about it, the more comfortable we can all be in our intimate relationships. Yeah, absolutely. And I think what you touched on is so important. And the other side of the coin that I didn't mention was looking at what I say to boys is quite often very different because it's so much is about that them desiring what their partner wants or what their partner likes or what their partner feels is pleasurable or safe and encouraging them to have the EQ and the communication skills to be in tune with that, to want that, to be like, well, Mm. of course I want my partner to enjoy this too. But so much of how sex is presented to men is is very much about you take this and you especially take it from women. It's about domination and control. And that's where so much of the message to boys needs to challenge that. And it's not to say that all boys hold that belief. I just know that that is the primary way that sex is presented to heterosexual boys and how do we actually unlearn that? And can I say that's me too, going on that journey of like, what did Hollywood and pornography and, and TV shows teach me about sex? And it was very mm-hmm. much about taking, not being interested in what my partner desires or what feels good for them. It was very much that solo self-focus. Yeah, they're all such great points. And there is also this other misconception, and that is that if you don't consent, it's solely up to you to speak up. This is something really that we need to get the messaging right around, isn't it, Daniel? Oh, absolutely. It shouldn't be put the onus on someone whether they do speak up enough or adequately or is the other person hearing what I'm saying? Like, not at all. That The onus needs to be on every person saying, am I interested in what my partner wants here? Am I actually interested in their feelings and their experiences of this moment, whether that's relational or sexual or any other content, uh, context rather? And so I think that is the the challenge and where this conversation is shifting and, and long overdue. For me, it's not just what can I get away with, but actually, am I interested in what my partner desires and wants? So, Daniel, another one of the misconceptions we've heard a lot about as well is, you know, people say that I gave consent or I received consent, but that's somewhere that we're looking to change the conversation, isn't it? And it's great. I love that this conversation is evolving. I love that so many wonderful advocates have put consent on the map. And now I feel like we've laid the foundations, but to evolve the conversation. So it's not that transactional legal, what can I get away with? Did I tick that box? But beyond that to actually, what do we both want? What are we both agreeing to here? Is this mutual? Is this reciprocal? Do we both get a say in this dynamic, whatever that may be? And that's what I think is just so important. And how do we communicate that verbally, uh, but also non-verbally? And are we actually in tune? Are we observing our partner's facial expressions, their body language? Are we actually interested in that? And I think not only is that going to ensure that we've got consent, but I don't know about you, but that's actually going to make for good sexual experiences where people are enjoying themselves and having a good time when your partner's actually in tune and interested in what's good and what's working for you and what's pleasurable for you. So I think for me, this is just a win-win. It's Because in my mind, I'm just like, this is such an obvious good thing that we would actually desire that our partners are having a good time here. Daniel, I agree. And I I often think you hear people talk about consent as a mood killer. And it's like, it's the complete opposite. Like I know as a woman, and that's all the only place I can speak from, but nothing creates better connection than feeling like you're communicating with your partner. And I just think that leads to better intimacy. But the idea of how to ask for consent I think at the moment is a sticking point for people because they assume the only way to ask for consent is to say, do you want to have sex at the beginning of the encounter, which we all know 
sometimes it starts in a place that's not straight at you're going to have sex. It might start a few steps before that. And then when do you bring it up? And that's the area that I find hard to have the conversation with other parents and teenagers about. What are some of the ways, I'd love to know from you, what are some of the ways you can ask for consent um, while you are in the act of intimacy with somebody? I think, yeah, that is part of the exchange and every, you know, person and every couple and every situation is going to be unique. And I think that's where when we're developing intimacy that's beyond just sexual, it's going to give us the tools, the language to know what this person likes and their body language in terms of what they're going to say and do in particular moments. And so I think, yeah, like if you're hooking up on the couch and like both people are enjoying this, it's like, hey, you know, what else would you like to do? What else feels good for you? Or, you know, like I think there's things that doesn't need to be so exactly asking for every single moment, but you can say like, are you enjoying this? Do you want to take things further? You could, for example, go to remove an item of clothing and this person like recoils or clearly doesn't like that, then stop. Let's just go back to kissing or whatever it is, you know, that that, that was happening in that moment. And I think it's just like, do you want to be in tune? Do you actually want to check in with what this other person's liking and enjoying? And I think it's just like, yeah, well, what else would you like to do? Or what does it actually look like with you and your partner in that moment? And I think, yeah, for me, it's just like, yeah, do you enjoy this? Does this feel good for you? And allowing that to evolve. Yeah, and I think that leads us really nicely into another misconception, and that's around the idea that you only have to check for consent one time. It's the first time you meet this person, you go home together, you go, hey, can we do this? And it's a yes, and it's all good. And then you're ticked and that's it. But that's not the case really, is it, Daniel? It's it's an ongoing conversation throughout a relationship. Yeah, I just think it's acknowledging the humanness of all parties. Like, I like different things on different days. I don't enjoy the same food I ate on Monday that I want to eat for dinner tonight. And so just because I enjoyed something one day, I mean, people's mental health changes, times of the month fluctuate. Like, people could have stresses. There could be other things going on in their lives. They could feel more adventurous one day to the next. Like, I just think that is just such an obvious human experience. So why wouldn't we want to be in tune with that and therefore meeting our partner where they're at? Like, you can ask and say, hey, maybe I want to be a bit more playful and adventurous. But if they're like, actually, I just want to cuddle on the couch tonight. Well, because hopefully you, you, you care about them. You're like, yeah, no problem. I understand that. You've had a long day. So I just think this idea that we've done something and we've gone to, you know, this level before or we've done this, I, I just think, yeah, that's great. But like every person is having a very different experience, even when it comes to a sexual experience. And you might not be up for the same things every single time. You know, and, and I think that's really good to be mindful of and to kind of have that empathy that goes both ways that, yeah, maybe some days like you're actually tired, you're exhausted and you, you don't particularly want to do something or, or maybe you, you know, you just want to give each other a massage. Like, let's actually just be people who are interested in what our partner's like and meeting them where they're at. You can ask the question, but like it, this for me is about empathy and mutuality and respect. I just think, yeah, that's the, the humanness of it all. I just think sex, particularly for a woman, is an incredibly emotional experience. And I think what Daniel just said then is so true that your emotions can change even in the moment of having it. And what you wanted at the beginning is not what you feel like in the middle or, you know, your mind starts to start thinking about other things or you even feel disconnected from your, the person that you're in that intimate moment for a second. So how you feel about the intimacy that's happening changes. I just think communication is the key. And I think to the guys out there, you will have so much better sexual experiences if you communicate. And I think it's so hard because there's so many things happening as a teenager. Embarrassment. I think so much of it is about not knowing and not understanding. I mean, you just have to look back at the fact that we were obsessed with Dolly Doctor as a kid because it was the only place we could get information because we didn't know. And even as a parent, I have to read up about it because I don't know half this stuff. And I think if we just talked about it more, and I remember getting this piece of advice once about parenting when talking about sex and consent, but I think it applies across the board that you don't have to nail it the first time and that this feeling like you're only going to get one chance to have a conversation with your kids about consent is just not there. Um, I think being inquisitive with your kids and being inquisitive with your partner about what they like and what they've heard and how they understand things and from not coming from a place of judgment. Yeah, that's such a good message to finish on, Carrie. Thank you. And thank you, Daniel, as well, for sharing your expertise. Such a great uh, conversation that we've managed to have today. Thank you both. So well said, Carrie. And thank you so much, Sasha. Thanks, Daniel. Thanks for your advice. You can come and talk to my family (laughs) anytime. (laughs) 
That was Carrie Bickmore, a Gold Logie winning television host, co-host of the hit network's Carrie and Tommy Drive Show and Mum to Three with ambassador and consent educator Daniel Principe. If you'd like to know more about consent, how to have conversations or you'd like to equip yourself with the tools to help educate someone, check your understanding and go to consent.gov.au. That's consent.gov.au. And that is it for today's episode. Just a reminder, this is episode one of a four-part series on consent in partnership with the federal government as part of its Consent Can't Wait campaign. Thanks for listening. I'm Sasha Barbagat. Catch you next time. Listener.